So, so we're live streaming on YouTube and we're now recording. Okay. Hello, everybody. It's another Thursday night and we are back. We've got Giselle with us for the first time in forever. Um, it's only been about two, three weeks, but it does feel like a lot longer because we've missed her. Um, welcome back, Giselle. It's Thank you. Lovely yes. Welcome to have back, you back. Thank you. The voice of, I dare I say the voice of reason, but I'm not sure if that's right. <laughs> I dare say that. She's, she's a rioter, so maybe not. But no. It's lovely to have you back. We've missed you. Um, but we're also excited to hear about what you've been up to this last three weeks. Um, because obviously we know about it because we're friends and behind the scenes, we kind of saw pictures and everything. But um, we thought it'd be a really good opportunity to leave today's session as a bit of a Q&A and also an opportunity for you to tell us what you've been up to um, ministry-wise, what you've been doing and some of the great work that God has been doing in the lives of the people that you've you've met um and then maybe just get opportunity to ask ask and or answer questions um as they come up here in the session today um so our people that have joined us can feel free to use the chat facility to ask any questions that you want not just about what G's talking about but just if you've ever wanted to ask us anything live, this is your chance. Um, I'm praying that we won't we won't sort of <laughs> regret <laughs> we've set ourselves up here. Um, but please use the chat function. Any questions about life, ministry, scripture, mm -hmm. or anything that perhaps you would like our opinions on, um, then yeah, just just chat chat it out and we'll read them out and, and attempt to answer them. Um and so Without further ado, drum roll, drum roll, drum roll, come on. <laughs> yep. Giselle, <laughs> talk to us about have... where you've been because we've been so envious looking at some of those pictures. Oh, were you really envious? Mm -hmm. It was nice mm -hmm. and hot. <laughs> there comes Miss Elizabeth again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I tell you, I've, I've missed you all. I really have. Um, and last Thursday night, Although I came home on the Wednesday, it was a hard slog out there because mm -hmm. you know the story um, that we missed a day and a half because the enemy did everything he could to stop us from getting out there. There was flights uh, delayed. There was flights cancelled. There was flights rearranged. We were supposed to be in Uganda, in Kampala, by three o'clock on the Tuesday. And we didn't get there till like, 10 o'clock a.m. on the Wednesday. So there was a whole day missed. Then they lost our luggage. And we were, yeah, we were another day without luggage. So Sue and I, oh. two old ladies in our 70s, hadn't been to bed since the Sunday night. We travelled all day Monday and all day Tuesday. And we got into our hotel on the Wednesday and we slept in our hotel room on the Wednesday night. And we had a shower on the Wednesday. And that was the first we showered since Monday morning as well. And we were in the same wow. clothes. But the our hosts were absolutely wonderful with us. And uh, they treated us like royalty. And wow. they actually went out on the Wednesday night and bought us some African caftans to wear. Ooh, and nice. they even guesstimated my height and got the shop where they bought them to alter the <laughs> height, the length and all in mine. And it was absolutely Aww. beautiful. So that meant in the, went, the Thursday morning when we got up, to hit the road running. At least we were able to get a shower and mm. uh, had some com, com, some clean clothes to put on us. But everything was crammed tight in the the, the, the remaining days. And we visited uh, four different villages mm -hmm. and a uh, two home groups in Kampala themselves and a school. So Oh, and the church as well. And then on the Sunday afternoon after church, there was 29 ba people baptised in Lake Victoria. So it was a grueling oh. thing. So I, so I was tired last Thursday, so I just couldn't be bothered coming on. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. We forgive you. We no. completely understand. That was full on. Thank you, that was really full on. Thank you so yeah. much. Did you get Thank your luggage, G? Yes, we, we, did yes, we, did. We, yes, we got it on oh, the wow. Thursday. 
which even put the schedule back too, because uh, Pastor Nelson and Pastor Hummer went out back out to Entebbe oh, Airport, geez. which is like was an hour and twenty minutes away from us to pick up the oh. luggage. She brought it back. Mm-hmm. So, it, but but it was all good. God God got us there. God supplied everything in the end. Uh, we mm-hmm. got our luggage, and we got out and we saw loads of lovely people in the different villages we really mm. do so tell us tell us a bit about sort of the, the people and their and their faith what was it like what did you experience oh. whilst you were out there because you know obviously we know that sometimes some especially in the rural parts of Africa um you know the there's it's a stark contrast with life mm-hmm. over here in the western world and how do you see that expressed in their daily lives or in their faith? What role did you see faith play in their lives whilst you were out there? Right. Well, I want to take a step back a, a, mm. a little bit, because when I first came to faith, I was living in central Florida. Mm-hmm. Uh, the very first church I got to go to when I came to faith was an African-American church. Mm. And I was the only white person at it. It's one of the nurses from the hospital where my late husband was took me to it. Mm-hmm. And I was the only white person. And I remember the first day I walked in, all these lovely black mamas, you know, the gorgeous big chest and all with them, they were going, mm-hmm. <laughs> she'll not keep up with us. But this honky showed them idol praise and worship as well. And I really, I love that African-American style of no inhibitions when it comes to praising God. There's mm-hmm. lots of hallelujah. Mm-hmm. There's lots of uh, uh, amens. There's lots of, yeah, I agree with you when the, the, the preachers are there and everything. And when I came back to, from living in Florida and came back to Northern Ireland, the church I attended was somewhat like that. A little bit reserved, but a lot like the, uh, the church I attended in Florida. And then, you know, I come to live in Stranraer, and oh my goodness me, it is spiritually dead here. You know, if you put, raise your hand in some churches, they're, you know, that's bad. So they sit in their hands and they, 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 the churches are okay, but the Holy Spirit isn't allowed in. Mm. God's not allowed in. And so going, going to uh, Uganda, oh, hallelujah. I was in my element. I was <laughs> back home again. It was absolutely brilliant. Because mm. these people, they have nothing materialistically. Mm-hmm. Other, the thing, what they have is their faith in God. They put their whole faith in God. They live by faith. They 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 ride their bike, their motorcycles by faith. If they uh, f- can afford a car, they they drive their cars by faith. They do everything by the faith of God, and it was mm. such a refreshing, beautiful time to be in the presence of people like that. And God showed up every time, even at the house groups. The presence of God was thick and fast. Mm. It really was. Mm. So then do oh, you wow. think there's maybe a correlation between what we have and perhaps our expression and maybe our experience of faith. I don't really want to say our experience of faith because that makes it sound like it's an experiential thing, but it's really not really. It's a living thing. But do you think maybe our 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 haves and our materialistic comforts can sometimes come in the way of our dependence on on God? Because like you've you've explained there some of these people, they've got only bikes and even the bikes they ride them by faith. (laughs) They do Um, big time. Big time, and you know, we we saw, and I'm I'm talking about little motorbikes, not fancy big motorbikes, little uh, mm. motorbikes, and they're only two seaters, and it was a uh, common sight to see three people on a bike, but then uh, mm-hmm. as we were going along in the van that we were in, um, it was driven about everywhere, we saw there's there's actually a picture of it that uh, there's four people, and one of the people's holding a baby. On, on on this little bike going down mm. the roads because they can't afford any other transport and everything to get to, from A to B and then B to A again. That's mm. how they travel. But mm. um, yeah, I really do think that like, my hubby Michael and I, we've often talked about uh, even before this Ugandan trip came up, because you know this only came up in a matter of weeks and uh, mm. 
God, you see, and there I was on faith too, and God supplied the finances for it because when I was invited out, my immediate reaction was, no, can't afford it. The ministry doesn't have any money because we're a very poor ministry. We just have enough to pay our bills and that's it. Maybe a few pounds left over after we've done our tithes and paid, paid our bills. And I said, well, uh, maybe next year for Save Hard, do a lot of fundraising and Save Hard. But mm -hmm. if God it to happen sooner, it'll happen. And the very next day, the money came in for the return ticket for two people and a hotel for a week for two people. Like, oh wow, that was God supplied that. That was that that was God. So and and every penny that we took out there with us, and we were able to take out, uh, and give them, five, or sorry, eight hundred pounds, uh, to buy food, and blankets, and books, wow. pens. And for people in the villages mm. oh wow it was it was god's hand all over it so it was mm. but yeah i honestly do believe in it and say michael and i often talk about this that people and i don't like calling africa a third world country because to be honest with you that what i saw of uganda could teach the people in the uk an awful lot about cleanliness and mm. about uh, uh family uh support and looking after people but um, they don't have as much material things as we have. And we mm -hmm. often say here that kids are dampened down because there are too many iPhones and there are too many iPads and even Androids, you know, just doesn't matter. And we tend to sit in front of the TV at night and that one-eyed monster is, our, we're slave to that. Mm -hmm. A lot of these people didn't have that. They don't have running water in, in the, uh, the villages. One beautiful village we went to, and uh, traditional huts, mud huts with thatched roofs, and a communal shower, a communal toilet, a communal cooking hut, a communal eating area. Uh, oh, wow. The huts where the people live in. This bedroom here is about 15, but no, maybe 16 foot long. Mm -hmm. And you could get two huts into this room, and that's where mm -hmm. the people wow. live. And they're beautiful. Families. Kids. They're beautifully made. Mm -hmm. um, they've no carpet or anything. The floor is mud, but it's swept out several times a day. So there's no. Oh, yeah. Out. Oh, they look. And yeah. You know, so they don't cook or anything in there, but they've got jet, they've got a couple of couches, maybe. Their beds are yoga mats. Mm -hmm. And lots of them were sleeping without blankets to cover them. And we were able to buy lots of blankets, six pound a pop these blankets mm -hmm. were and we took these blankets to the people and it was like giving them a million pounds because they had a new blanket and these people shared with us everything they had they took us into their homes let us see their homes mm -hmm. uh, gave us fresh fruit ladies you know the mango mm -hmm. trees the pineapple trees the banana mm -hmm. trees you know they just go out cut the stuff down open it up and share it with you and we were able to leave them, you know, the sort of big bags, like uh, 10 kilo bags of rice mm -hmm. and uh, yes. uh, maize flour and other staples. So each of the four villages and the school we went to, I think we left enough staples like maize and rice for them and some other stuff like that to maybe last them for a month. Okay. Praise Jesus. That is wonderful. We were able wow. to put that on... Uh, First of all, five hundred pounds. Then, uh, the, we we left another three hundred pounds for them to uh, uh add more stuff to to that after that. So it's amazing what you were what we were able to do with very little money. That was mm -hmm. because first of all, we tried to raise three thousand, so we could mm -hmm. leave a lot of stuff, but all we could raise was eight hundred pounds, and mm -hmm. we, that was good. Mm -hmm. that, was, that, 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 that sounds was. amazing. I really like the idea, actually, of a communal kitchen. <laughs> I don't know why, but I quite like it. Because I, I think in Europe, at some point, that used to happen, where they had, I don't know, no, I think I'm thinking of North Africa, where they have, like, communal ovens. I remember somebody telling me about that. And I think there's just something cool yeah. about, and I'm just thinking about how, uh, the people you went to CG, were they already Christians? Or were they, just, like, locals that you just went to visit? A, lo a, lo a lot of them were. Now, what Pastor Nelson explained to, to uh, Sue and I when we were there, 
I felt guilty by spending all the money on the return plane tickets and the hotel room for Sue and I because I thought that that money would be better spent for the people. And I told Nelson that, and he said no, that him and the team were going out around all these villages. They'd be going out around these villages for about a year. They, they visit them every week. And they have been telling the people the gospel, but the people were, yeah, okay, but they didn't really believe it. But then two old ladies, two old white ladies from the UK come across <laughs> And we preach, we're on fire, we're preaching, you know, I'm preaching hell and damnation all over again, you know, sort of salvation, repent, repent. And we cast it's your out health demons, thing. yeah, we were casting out demons, we were breaking down witch doctors, we were casting out curses. And the people then believed what the, the, the ministry team in Uganda were already doing. So mm -hmm. they then committed themselves to Christ. So they'd been attending the church on a weekly basis. But they hadn't actually wow. committed until last week. Um, ah. So so when uh, Pastor Nelson and Pastor Hummer explained that to me, I then realized that what money was we spent to get there was well worth spent because it really you know, it it knocked the uh, uh, nail into the the final nail in uh, mm. for people to come to Christ. So I think there was about roughly about 250 people actually committed themselves to Christ uh, mm -hmm. there. That's a lot of people. In, was that in one day, G? Or... Oh, no, 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 no. That that was over the several days. That was over four villages. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, and, even so, the that's time. a lot of people. Yeah, it, it is a lot of people. Uh, yeah. And I was humbled at that, that. I was pleased. I was blessed. And I'm humbled that God was able to use this wee old woman to be able to go out and do that. Um, mm. I'm looking forward to the next one. The team out there would like us back in October. But again, Ooh, October sensible. this year. Yep. But again, I'm trying to be sensible. That, you know, I can't afford it. But Lord, if you want us out in October this year, you'll supply the finances. I, but definitely by hook or by crook, we'll be back out next May again. Mm -hmm. Because we've got to go out and see how the church, how, it's, how it's growing. Because oh yes, I God gave me a word of prophecy for the church in uh in you in in Kampala that uh mm. God gave me the showed me the vision that the church is going to grow now the church can't grow by land by the building size, mm -hmm. but God showed me the vision of there's going to be three different services every Sunday there'll be an, an early oh, wow. one a midday one and an afternoon one. So that's how the church is going to grow. So I got to get back out again and see them. Uh -huh. mm, to organize it. Yeah. yeah, I'm just thinking, how did you get involved with the people in Kampala to begin with, G? Uh, <laughs> through Facebook. Oh, see, Mark Zucchi can do good things. Yes. <laughs> Pastor Nelson joined Pearls of Grace Facebook group way back about mm, a year and a half ago. Okay. And he then started coming to the uh, Tuesday night Bible study mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. then I had opened it up to remember it started off as woman only, but then mm -hmm. a man challenged me and he was calling me sexy and he was going to complain me, complain about it and all the rest of it. So I opened it up to men and women. So Pastor Nelson started joining us from Kampala and then he brought his wife along. And then he brought his mm. uh, his family along and they joined wow. every week faithfully uh, from Kampala. And then in November, well, I knew before then he had had his own church out there. But then in November, he spoke to me seriously about uh, joining forces. And he wanted to change the name of the church, the Galilee Church, to Pearls of Grace. And I said, mm. yes, by all means, let's do it. And then, oh. uh, when was it? January? No, February. He just threw it out there one night. Right, where uh, the names changed to the Pearls of Grace, and you have to come out and visit it. So we're invite formally inviting you out. That was it. Oh wow! So you see, Facebook, wow. the internet, Zoom has made the world just a large village. Mm, that, that, that's a 
there's times that I'm very pleased about the internet, you know. I mean, we talk a lot about um, technology and how it can be a source of distraction or the source of bad things that can happen. But, you know, I always think of the internet as a knife, right? You can use a knife to, you know, cut up your food that you're going to, you're going to cook or you can use it to to stab somebody. And I think a good lesson from this is that we can be very intentional about how we use the internet. I mean, we're here on Zoom talking, right? Mm. And without the internet, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know G, I wouldn't know Sidoni. <laughs> you know, I probably would have met Sidoni anyway, yes. right? Yeah, Cameron, we, we, or another, we would have found out ourselves um, quite possibly. But I really love, and I think maybe can you just talk a little bit more for people who are maybe wanting to do ministry or Christians who are very suspicious of the internet because there's still some people who are very kind of mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, this technology, mm -hmm. we have to live with it these days. But I think historically, some Christians at least have been very hostile to anything technology. What would you say to people like that as a minister of the gospel who's really using it to spread the gospel? The internet, technology and the internet is a great thing when it's used correctly. And way back in the early days, I really do believe that the technology and the internet was a tool of Satan to keep us captive. But God has taken what the enemy has meant for bad and turned to good. Mm -hmm. And especially through the time of COVID, when people couldn't go out to physical churches that's and all the true. rest of it. And that's when the Thursday afternoon after, ladies afternoon tea started tea. uh for christian in the uk and that's still going on mm -hmm. now even wow. though now not that many people turn up to it but there's the old faithfuls and it was on this afternoon it won't be on next week because we meet in person next week but it's on Ooh, every other thursday nice. and that is still going on so that wouldn't have happened um if it hadn't been for the internet and it hadn't been for covid and yeah I know there's lots of people out there. There's lots of scammers out there and all the rest of it. you got to pray about everything. Now, mm -hmm. when Nelson, for example, started joining every Tuesday night, and then Stephanie runs the uh, the, the Monday night Bible study, She mm -hmm. hers was woman only. She was adamant it was woman only. I'm not going to be like you, G. I'm not going to go with men as well. That's, that's fine. It's up to you. Keep it woman only. God has told me it's okay to uh, have men on it as well. So that's that's fine. But you remember first Stephanie was in hospital for quite a few weeks. She <laughs> yeah. was, yeah. Yeah, she was. And she when she eventually came back, hers was opened up to men as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh maybe God had some words with Stephanie on that hospital bed. <laughs> no, I opened no, My I G opened, opened it up. I opened it up to men as well. Yeah. Oh, I did, yeah. It is G G. Yeah. She's been letting them in. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Nelson and Noel was wanting to come to it, and I said, "I right, come on, come on, come on." Ah, I see. Um, you have to be fair to everyone. You have to be. No, you just, really, a, just have to be. A select and I know, few. and I know, there's a lot of people, even women, say that women shouldn't teach men. Well, that's interesting. It is interesting. Say something about that, G. It 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 really is. Well, what I say is, I'm not teaching men. I'm not a teacher. I'm a preacher. And there's a big difference. Okay. Some people think that's worse. No, 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 no. I am preaching hell and damnation and repentance through Jesus and uh, uh, living free and in, in, well, free of the laws and everything in Jesus Christ. I'm not actually, te I'm not a teacher. I'm a preacher. So there's a big difference. And God has <laughs> called me to this. And I often quote, the great woman of the Bible, like the woman at the well, the woman with the issue of blood, Mary Magdalene, they were all women, and God used them. They they spread the gospel. They ran through the streets. She was shouting, you know, he's alive, he's alive. And the woman with the issue of blood, she didn't go home and sit down and be quiet, even if she did go home and sit down and quiet. She was out there. Just by her being able to come out of the house, she preached that she was healed. And the mm -hmm. woman at the well, didn't Jesus tell her to go and tell everybody? So there, there is a big difference between being a teacher and being a preacher. But even at that, when Paul said in Corinthians that he does not allow a woman to speak in church, look who he was talking to. He was talking to women who were involved again in paganistic rituals. 
And I yeah, believe, was... yeah, there's a little bit of w w words left out there in translation. I don't believe, I don't allow these women to preach in church mm -hmm. or teach in well, church. Well, I mean, I think, I think just even, you know, you have biblical points that people always argue about this. But I'm looking at it from a very pragmatic point of view because this is, you know, how the world has always been. I'm just thinking, let's say there is a place in this world that hasn't heard of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You happen to be there and you had the message gospel. Mm -hmm. Would it really be right to deprive people of the gospel? No, nope. because you're a woman. Mm -hmm. So I think context matters a lot in those things. And I remember Derek Prince actually mentioning a, a situation like that that happened in Russia. And the people who were capable at the point of leading and teaching were women. So they did, and they were able to groom um, a male pastor, I think, to take over the leadership. But I think when we say these things as Christians, we kind of have to be, you know, just be sensible, be, be really pragmatic. I mean, those of us who... Um, May a handful of Nigerians who are listening to this will probably know. It's a lady called Mary Slesser. And she's um a missionary who went out to Nigeria and you know she did that amazing stuff out there. I think, if I'm not mistaken, she helped end the traditional practice of killing twins amongst certain tribes. And Mary Slesser went into this part of the land where men didn't want to go. You know, <laughs> she went, you know, that place till today honors her memory because she became so part of the community. I think she just stayed and ended up being buried there when she died. She adopted a child or children. I can't quite remember. But that woman was transformative to that community. And so you think, what should that community have waited 50 more years for some guy to be ready? So I, I, I often think, to me, sometimes it's not even a question of arg arguing biblical points. It's common sense. You know, if this gospel is to go to all parts of the earth, are you going to keep quiet? Because... You will almost be, well, this is me speaking. You will almost be like that, the worker who buried his talent yes. because you know the gospel and you refuse to spread it. That's a wicked act. That if is. you go by the judgment that, you know, the the the, the master gave. So I, yeah, I always just go on practicalities. Look, and there are times when there is a woman in that church because of exposure and study, she happens to know stuff that the men don't know. If she can fill in, I don't see why not. It doesn't it doesn't always have to be some kind of challenge to men, I don't think. And personally, I just wish more men and women would see that because you know what? No one really wins the gender wars, if we're honest. Now, Pastor Nelson and the team back in Uganda are encouraging women in the villages. And uh some in lot a lot lots of the churches out in the different villages, they're female pastors. And there's female elders. Uh, lots of them too. There's male. But it's whoever is got the anointing of God on them. That uh mm -hmm. it's... Gee, I think you make you make yeah. a very good distinction between preaching and teaching. Yeah. I never actually thought about that, but I'm sitting here What's processing the difference, what you're saying. But you know, we we've all got a mandate to preach and sp spread the gospel, haven't we? We've we've all got a mandate, you know, God says. Christ says, take the, the gospel to all the nations of the earth and say, we've all got a mandate, whether that's by the way we live our lives or by speaking the gospel, but we've all got a mandate to preach, to, to which is essentially mm -hmm. spreading the gospel. But perhaps we also don't all have a mandate to teach the gospel. And maybe mm. that's where that's where the, the, the subtleties lie, you know, preaching, because you could be an evangelist and you could be preaching. Like G says, she's a, you know, I, I haven't called her this for ages, but she's my supermarket preacher. She will preach. <laughs> yes, <laughs> she will. Yeah. She will. Um, and that's, that's, there's, there's a subtlety there that I perhaps haven't considered. And as you're speaking, I'm, I'm processing it. And, and essentially we are all called to be, to be preachers. Yes. We're all called to spread the gospel. Yes. Yes. Um, wherever we are found, wherever, whether that's in a remote community or that's on the front line of our jobs as nurses or shop assistants or, or floor attendants or care workers or carers or parents, wherever our front line is, we're all called to spread spread the gospel, which is essentially preaching yes. um, the good news. But I suppose we're, we're not all called to teach the gospel. Yep. You know, that's, that's, no. that's, I don't that's past, you know, pastors that um 
yeah that's a that's a different calling altogether but that's interesting I've never actually thought of thought of that until you just you just said it but yeah and you, and you see what where I'm coming from as well is God gave me the ministry back in 2011 and from 2011 up till 2019 I went out I was guest speaker at loads of different churches and all the rest of it and I would go in and stir up a hornet's nest and leave them to sort it out and I would leave again I was a preacher I was a traveling mm. preacher and then in 2019 God told me plant a church and I went ah me plant a church Ugh, me stay in one place <laughs> but what were you that nomadic G <laughs> what was that Negum so were you that nomadic Yes, I really was. I was out around different villages he here in the mm. UK and different towns and things like that. Mm. Yeah, I had speaking engagements lined up all over the place. Um, mm. But when God told me, plant a church, I'm going, ah, you want me in one place? So mm. um, I didn't have the finances to plant the church. Mm. So what God directed me to do was hire village halls myself and put on uh instead of being a guest speaker put on an event mm. fast forward mm. i didn't realize covid was mm. good god did and a lot of the speaking engagements closed down but by then mm. i had built up a little um congregation of people mm. coming to the village the the, the, the community oh. center things and then it went online and hey ho that was it oh wow yeah. yeah actually i'm just interested you said god told you to open the church like how did you hear that i'm just fascinated was it like a voice from heaven giselle open a church you know what did you No, that one came in a dream <laughs> came in a dream ah uh -huh, okay and i was sort of uh the next day lord i remember that dream in in, in technicolor detail lord you but lord that can't be for me because you got me. I'm a traveling preacher. Then I heard the voice, no, plant the church. And I went, ah, oh. and that was it. That oh, was, wow. That was it. Because he does speak to us through scriptures, through songs, through dreams, through visions, that audible voice, that gut feeling, and other people coming to tell us things, you know. So we just, we, we got we got to be open to as, as, as different things. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, that's true. It's really, yeah, no, that's yeah, wow, yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking of like one of my favorites, Elizabeth Elliot, and she was very much. She was a missionary, you know. She was, she was a speaker and she was an author, but she she never really, and I think I think I even heard her once say she's never really called herself a pastor. Yeah. She's not a teacher. She was a speaker and a preacher. A speaker and a preacher. But she she yeah. said she deliberately mm. never really called herself a pastor or a teacher because that's. You know, she didn't believe that that was mm -hmm. what women were called to do. But like Eugene, she said, you know, obviously she's got a message from God for the earth and she yep. definitely got her message out there. So, yeah, it's it's. um. Well, it's, know, like, I think... well it's like even go back even further when uh, when I was living in Florida and the opportunity came up for me to go to Bible school. Mm. And I thought, OK, I'll go to Bible school. And, but then when my then husband passed away and I came back to Northern Ireland, I didn't carry it on. But the offer came about that I could carry it on online uh, and n mm. not, not, not be in person. Me, I can't afford it. A couple of weeks later, it was reduced greatly. The phase still can't afford it. At the end of the day, I got it for practically nothing mm -hmm. and the money to pay for it was provided. Mm -hmm. So to me, that was God. So I went through that and I thought then, okay, well, God wants me to do this. So I went through it. Now, I didn't get to my graduation because it was in Florida and I was in Northern Ireland, but I am an ordained minister. But mm -hmm. I don't like to call myself minister or reverend because, you know, there's nothing reverend about The this. right reverend. Yeah, the, the right, right reverend, reverend. is out. <laughs> um, I think so, that the word minister actually means servant. Okay, so if people well, took that word seriously. Well, that's, you that's know. yes, you're absolutely right yeah. about that. But um, that's why if I have to use a title, 
I thought pastor was a more friendly, more, you know, yeah, more friendly. Not the right reverend. That's Giselle. Right. Like, no, no. That's that, the that, no. That, that, Reverend that, doctor. Yeah, you know it, true get pompous. a PhD. Yeah. But I don't so, even like using the title uh, pastor. But when I was in Uganda, one of the gorgeous ladies that uh, part of the team, and she looked after me very, very, very well. She kept calling me Pastor Giselle. And I said, look, Faith, just call me Giselle. Don't call me Pastor. She says, but did God not call you to this? I said, yes. She said, then God gave you the title. You should use it. And that was a slap across the face for me. It really was. That's also possibly cultural. Because I think yeah. in many African societies, kind of, you know, we are... We're used to according people their respect based on age or, you know, professional rank or I mean, even in secular communities. Oh, people don't play with their doctor, engineer mm -hmm. or whatever. So part of it like sometimes. If you, were, if you were a nurse, like, they'd be like, nurse, she's out. Like, nurse, she's out. Oh, yeah. Engineer. Yeah. 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 Oh, no. Part yeah. of it is cultural. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes yeah. if somebody is like older than you or somebody who could be the same age as your mom, for most people who are brought up culturally in African communities, even in this country, it's hard for them to just refer to you by your first name. I mean, I've had Nigerian kids I don't know see me on the street. I refer to me as auntie, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So yeah, yeah mm -hmm. it's yeah. Well, well, well. Look, a lot of them out there started calling me Mama G too because Pastor Nelson told them that this is Mama G. Um, yeah. But, yeah. But now, but now my name, but, but now my name's changed because. Nelson and I got on very, very well together. Mm. And I've always liked him, you know, through the uh, the camera and everything. But when we got out there, he decided, I think was it, uh, I can't remember, the Sunday, no, the Saturday or the Sunday afternoon, he decided, he said, right, he said, you're now Mama Nelson. And his Aww. wife, Irene, said to so, and you're Mama Irene. Aww, so um, nice. that's, that's it. So... I'm 71 and I've got a 60 year old son. So how that works out. I, 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 so you had I, him when you were how old? You were I, really, I really don't know. But um, yeah, you know, the respect yeah. I have for people and what I love about, uh, and I can't speak for any other parts of Africa, but in Uganda, how they look after their elderly people is absolutely amazing. No mm. old people's homes, no nothing. You get to the age where you need to be looked after. You go to your son's house or your daughter's house, but generally your son's house, and you are well looked after. We were treated, when we were getting out of the vehicle at different villages and things like that, even, even at the church in Kampala, we weren't allowed to carry our Bibles or carry our bottles of water. People rushed up to carry them for us. And no exaggeration, mm -hmm. we were practically lifted and carried into the buildings. And Ooh, one of the see. one of the villages that we went to, uh, the main mama escorted Sue into the church, and when we were leaving, she escorted me out of the church, and that was a big mm. honor to have her because she was she she she's like she as I, I suppose she's like maybe the the village chief or something like that. Nice. Yeah, okay. mm. and mm. that was a big yeah. big 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 honor. And they did explain to us, uh, as soon as we got there, the culture that, um, first of all, I saw one of the, the, the ladies bow down to Pastor Hummer and Pastor Nelson. And I wasn't sure it was happening. But Pastor Hummer explained to me, that's the culture. And mm -hmm. uh, he said that when you meet people, he said, they will bow down to you too. He said, don't stop them because he saw me earlier try to stop somebody. And he said, don't stop them. He said, because that's our culture and that's us honoring you. So it took it took me ages to get used to people buying down to me because mm. the only person I will say I'll ever buy down to is Jesus. Mm. Yes. Um, yeah. But, you know, it it was an absolute that's honor. That's a cultural difference. Yes. But so, yeah, yeah. I mean, they go and go. Now, I was just going to say, for East Africans, I think in general, they're quite big on honor because I know that Ugandans, they even knew to greet their elders, certainly the women. Yep. Like, and it could be like they could see an, an older person on the street, a young girl, and she would kneel in the middle of the road. So it's, yeah, it's quite a thing with them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, more, the, the moral of tonight is trust God. Yes. You know, Proverbs 3 5 and 6. 
put all your tr- and I'm paraphrasing, put all your trust in God. Don't go on your own resources. Don't go on what you think's best. And your little trust intelligence. God. Trust God. Mm. And you don't see everything. the whole picture. Yeah. Mm. Because he does make a way and and there and there is a uh saying going about uh social medias that not all storms come to with to disturb to destroy. some yeah, to to destroy. Yes. Yeah. Now, we do need to know the difference that whether they're coming to disturb us from the enemy or they're coming from God to clear our paths. Mm. And as I've spoken to somebody else about this, that lots of times God asks us to walk away from relationships, could be a partnership or a you know a work colleague or a friend or something. But he does ask us at times to come away from relationships. He asks us at times to give up things so that he can give us a bigger blessing. But because we think we know better than God, we, no, 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 I'm holding on to this. We hold on to our baggage, our past hurts, our past regrets, our past everything. We carry that about with us like a badge of honor. It's time mm. we threw it all off us and let God be God in our lives. Mm. Yeah. I like that. Amen. That's, a, that's a good way to close. Let God be God. Exactly. Yes. Let God be God. Just hand it all over to him. Yep. No matter how difficult that is. For some of you control freaks out there, I'm not putting <laughs> myself in that equation. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I'm really trying, I am I am a living example about what God can do. In Northern Ireland, yeah. when I was living there, the house I was living in, now, I landed in Northern Ireland on a Monday with only suitcases full of clothes, no place to live. I walked into my own house with furniture and everything on a Friday. That was several days. Wow. God supplied that. Living mm. there, paying rent, private rented house, paying out of my savings. The landlord wanted to put the rent up. And I'm right, Lord, I can't afford this. But if you want me to stay here, you'll supply the funds. Two days later, a couple came to my door and said, gee, we want to put, uh, give you some money into your personal pot. Now, not your ministry pot, your personal pot. I said, yeah, I know. That's fine. God's told me it's coming. And it was the £50 extra a month that I needed to pay my rent. I love those type of stories because you know what? They really stay up faith. Because yeah. sometimes you can find yourself, I mean, logically, a lot of the time you will just be like, oh, it's hard to believe that, right? And this is why sometimes people will say to Christians, oh, that was a coincidence. You know, but it's nice when people share these stories and the more they hear them, the more sometimes you even go back and look at things that have happened in your life. Because I know that there are times when I'm like, oh, God, X, Y, Z. And then I hear a little voice say, but hold on, X, this, that, and the other happened. And did you notice? You know, so it's really good when people share these type of testimonies of provision, of um, anything that God has done for you. Really, I, I encourage people sharing testimonies because you never know who your testimony is going to touch at any point. Somebody may be going through something and they hear this Giselle. Mm-hmm. And you know they they have more assurance about how to handle whatever financial issue they're dealing with. Exactly, yeah. and, and think... you even just recently the trip to Uganda, God supplied. Oh yeah, the... that's it. yeah. Exactly. I know we're about to end, but yeah, I have a quick question for you because you talked about how hard it was for you to get there, right? All the you know the flight cancellations and all that, and how did you recognize that that was warfare? Well, what did you uh, do about it? Well, the flight from, we had to go from Glasgow to Heathrow to get the connecting flight from Heathrow to Qatar and then from Qatar to Entebbe. Mm. The flight from Glasgow was an hour and a half late, which was putting us really tight. When we get into Heathrow, we flew into Terminal 5 and we had to get to Terminal 4, which everybody that knows Heathrow, that is miles apart. We got to the check-in at Guitar Airlines. The, 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 the plane door was still open. They hadn't even closed the door yet. But BA had taken us off the flight. Because we, we I booked it all through BA. But BA, mm. don't, but BA don't fly to Uganda. So they, they subcontracted to, to Guitar Airlines. Guitar. Mm. And as soon as we got there, uh, and said you're taken off the flight. I just thought, Satan, this is bad. This is this 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 is bad. This is of Satan. And then 
we were told we had to get back to Terminal 5 because BA have, don't have a desk at 4, they have a desk at 5. And if we went back to 5, they would uh, give us a voucher for a hotel for the night. But this is like 11 o'clock at night, and we go to go out, and there's everything's been closed up then. So we asked a worker, we need to get back to Terminal 5. Why? Our flight here is cancelled, and we have to get back to Terminal 5. A supervisor came and spoke to us, and he said, I can't let you out of here. And I said, why? And he said, well, because if you get, if we can get you transport, because all of the uh, shuttles and things were sh uh, closing down for the night, he said, if we can get you a shuttle over to Terminal 5, he said, I don't know if Terminal 5 is still open. He said, you could end up outside all night. So he insisted, oh, wow. we, yeah, so he insisted we stay at Terminal 4. But everything shut down, you know, the uh, check-in areas and everything, the big steel shutters came down. And there was a Cafe Nero in sort of like just the, you know, like a public area. And we just sit mm. there all night in hard chairs. Uh, wow. Uh, until our flight, the, we could get back to Terminal 5 the next morning when it's, everything started opening up at 5 o'clock again. And uh, we got the shuttle over to Terminal 5 because we knew that uh, British Airways had put us on a quarter to nine flight in the morning. So if that wasn't oh, wow. the enemy trying to stop us from getting there, I don't know what was. You don't, yeah. you don't, were you praying you, during that time then, G? Yes, of course we were. We prayed, uh, get uh, the enemy out of it all over the place. And then, you know, when we did get our BA, our BA flight then took us to Nairobi instead of Qatar. We went to Nairobi and uh, we gets into Nairobi and our flight's supposed to leave Nairobi at 5 to 1 a.m. to get us into Entebbe at 10 past 2 a.m. We gets in, we checks in we get our boarding pass and they tell us your bags are all the way through have a nice flight we went and got a cup of coffee went and sat down we hadn't even sipped at the coffee got a message your uh 12 55 a.m flight's been cancelled it's now going wow. out at, it's now going out at 6 a.m so we'd sit in nairobi airport again but we, wow. treated, but we treated ourselves then. We had we had to go and sit in comfortable seats and get some sleep because we hadn't slept since Sunday. And we paid some money and went into the executive lounge. And we had a nice meal there. And uh, um, uh, lovely, 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 big, comfortable seat. But again, you see, that was God's planning too because the supermarket preacher spoke to a woman there sue went off to the bathroom and i'm hello how are you and all the rest of it and within two minutes she knows i'm a born again believer and she said hallelujah i'm a pastor from south africa she was on her way for a, a crusade somewhere so we've made connection there and uh so you see god's hand was all over that what the enemy tried to destroy and yes on the at one point on the monday night sitting in uh monday nights tuesday morning sitting at heathrow airport I said to Sue, right, if we could get out of here and I can get a flight back to Glasgow, I'm going back home. I really, I, I'd had enough of it. I really had. But then Sue said, no, she was sensible at that point and said, no, let's pray about it. And God gave us more strength and God cleared the path. And we eventually oh, wow. got there. And hallelujah, it was all hallelujah. worth it. So let God be God. Yep. Let God Amen. Be God. That's good. That's good. Oh, thanks, G, for sharing that experience. Um, yes, indeed. Shall we pray before we say good night? Yeah. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much um, for the opportunities to take the gospel to all nations of the earth. Thank you for strength and provision um, and sisters and brothers all over the world. We thank you, Lord, for from Giselle and Sue and Pearls of Grace and the work that you're doing through them, Lord, to bring so many to know of the gospel of Christ. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to help them and give them strength um, to be able to do the work and to continue to sp spread the gospel. We ask, Lord, that you would give each and every one of us um, the courage to preach the gospel um, wherever we may find ourselves in our front lines. Be with us this week, Lord, and um, help us, Lord, to speak of you um, to our friends and our families and our colleagues and, and wherever we find ourselves this week. 
Give us the courage to speak of you boldly. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, everybody, for joining in. Good night, good everybody, night. And, and you and too. We'll see you next good week. Night. And good night, everybody.